progress. Hi, Steph. You guys have won 20, 26 consecutive playoff series where you guys have won at least one game on the road. What is it that you guys are able to like just weaponize your opponent's court? Uh, we, we always know how to just find a way to win games, no matter what style it is, high scoring, low scoring, defensive battle, shootout, whatever it is. And we find uh, another level of grit and, and determination and it's an ability to find a way to get it done and, and, and be in hostile environments where you get tested, you get pushed, you, you know, and our experience kind of shows at the right time. So obviously in this situation, it's a must for us to uh, win a championship and we got to be up for that task. Brandon on the right. Steph, <clears throat> Steph what's good? Brandon Scoopy Robinson, Valley Sports. Um, Clay talked about how he watched, or what has recently watched, as of, I guess a day or so, uh, YouTube videos to kind of get some motivation going. Uh, shooting wise, uh, of himself. He, Is that what he's insinuating? Yeah, like the best, all the best do that. No, I like that. <laughs> I like that. You you make mention that all the best do it. Who outside of yourself do you watch on YouTube shooting? That's a great question. Uh, go back and watch Ray Allen clips. Obviously Reggie, Seth Curry. Uh, who else I watch? That's the top of the list. Might throw some old Virginia Tech Dell Curry highlights in without the three-point line. But uh, other than that, you're kind of just watching a lot of just film of other games and, and all that. So it's not so much a YouTube thing. It's more just being an NBA fan and just watching uh, Marcus Thompson, unbelievable. I'm calling you. Uh, it's like when you're in church and like the pastor's giving a sermon and you over there with your phone. Uh, you just more so just being an NBA fan and just consuming as much uh, basketball as possible and you start to get motivated and inspired by, you know, all different type of people. Uh, 50 50. He had a lot of great moments in both years. We'll go to Marcus next. Yes. I'd like to begin by repenting for my press conference sins. <laughs> <laughs> Two questions for you. Uh, one, is there any, I mean, you're a you know, basketball historian. Is there any feel or juice from you're, you know, you're about to play a finals game in Boston against the Celtics, like as a as an NBA head. What does that feel like? I don't know why this keeps going off. It's my daughter. She needs to stop. Don't blame uh, it on the kid. It is. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, uh, and then, and, see? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, and then secondly, why do you think Gary Payton has become such a beloved figure so fast? Like, what is it about him? I don't know why this is happening. I think the, I'll start with GP, like, is I think probably a lot of, you know, just his name first and foremost in terms of, you know, basketball history and it's so hard to make this league in general, but all, even harder when, when I would feel like the odds of like the NBA's, you know, player's son trying to, you know, follow in the dad's footsteps. It's a difficult, you know, challenge and journey for him, you know, coming out of college and trying to find his way, you know, G League, training camp offers, bouncing around the league all over the place, and then finally find, finding a home. And last year, him coming in and making an impact. And uh, I think he was on two-way last year. And, like, he was available, but not really. And then knowing he could really help us this year, and then it actually proven to be – uh, an amazing difference maker. I think fans really resonate with that. They love the way you know he approaches the game, his energy. Uh, he he changes games without really you know having crazy scoring outputs. He's just the stuff that 
you just get so much energy from watching them defend and you know disrupt and do all that type of stuff. Fans love that, and and we love it too as a teammate. So it's been awesome to watch his growth and development this year. And uh, you know him coming off that injury, that moment he checked back in the game was was a, a amazing. Uh, you know, response from the crowd that gave us a lot of juice. And, uh, you know, I'm sure more of that to come in this series. What was the other question? Oh, Boston. Yeah, this is special. Like, this the historic team, the dynasties from, you know, the, the 80s and, and how many championships they won, you know, over the course of the years. All the different highlights you watched that, you just have a different iconic look when you see it on TV. Uh, you know, just watching Larry Legend do what he did in his, his entire career, even looking at the Boston LA series, uh, KG and, you know, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, Rondo, and getting the championship here. KG's hilarious post game. Any, anything is possible, whatever. So there's a lot of history in this, in this city and in this, in, in this building. And, um, should be an amazing atmosphere, you know, out there on the court tomorrow and uh, and Friday. Brian on the left. Steph, have you found as you've gone through your career that the rims and the arenas are all generally the same? I know Jordan said something in the Denver series. I don't know if that was a joke or, but just in general, as you've gone across. Well, that was because I think he saw one of them was offline or something that nobody else really saw. And then they actually checked it, and it was like yeah, it was off center by like an inch or so. Uh, I I see it more as like just the different venues have different you know backdrops and lighting and stuff that you get certain shooters like more than others. It just depends on uh, kind of what your flavor is. So I probably I like Dallas was like it had it's such it's like a bright arena, and I I just like the lighting in there. The backdrop in uh, in Madison Square Garden is dope because it's just, it's the stage lighting and it's dark. Like, I, I just the certain things you see and you 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 prefer um, the different arenas and rims around the league. So that's how I see it more so than the actual rim itself. Oh, I'm here on the left. Uh, Steph, Om Young, this is ESPN. I think you can forgive Marcus. Yesterday was his birthday, so he's getting old. So. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, there are not many teams that have two great all-time shooters like you and Clay. When one of you guys might be in a little bit of a slump, do you guys talk to each other? Do you guys give each other tips, or is it an unspoken thing? Very unspoken thing. I think there's conversations around, like, maybe play calls or different looks to try to get somebody a good shot, but it's not so much mechanics or building up anybody's confidence because you don't get to that level if your confidence is that shaky, where you know a couple of bad games, you're like, "Oh, the, wor the world's falling," um, and we both understand that that vibe. You don't want to, and honestly, you don't really want to hear anything about it <laughs> if you're going through it yourself, because you know at any moment you can you can you know spark yourself to get back on track and get out of it. So, um, it's the best thing you could probably say is just keep shooting, because that's the only way you get yourself you know out of. Uh, some some rough patches. I don't like to use that S word. Last couple of questions. Monty on the right. Stefan, um, you watched Clay the last first two games and he hasn't shot the ball as well as he can, but knowing his history, is there? do you have a certain, I don't know, peace of mind or whatever in knowing that what has happened the first two games is going to stop at some point? History with him has shown there's no predictor to when a, uh, he can just take it to another level. Um, regular season playoffs, he's, he's, he's always just found a way um, to get himself going and to, you know, especially in the playoffs, just to make an impact that's loud. Usually it's really loud. Um, and he, and he his demeanor never really changes. Um, it's not really something you can just look at and be like, oh, if, if you saw him right now, you think he's, you know, averaging 50 in this series. Like, he's got a just a very confident look about him. 
and that's the best thing about him. Uh, it's all about the work you put in. It's about the mindset. He doesn't need any teaching points on that, and so that's why there's so much confidence that at any moment he can he can go off. Last question, Joe here in the middle. Hey, Steph. <clears throat> I wanted to go off topic here a little bit as a big golf fan like you are and somebody who actually occasionally works with the PGA. I'm just wondering if you had any um, opinion or thoughts on what's going on with the, the Saudi tournament and guys leaving the PGA and just if you had any concerns or just thoughts on that issue. Uh, from my vantage point, I'm very fascinated by the reasonings guys are leaving the tour because there's there are certain moments where there's an acknowledgement that the tour has done an amazing job supporting players, but there's room. For, there's always room for improvement on uh, ways to increase their uh, the revenue streams or their ownership of what the tour is doing or their awareness of what the tour is doing and all those, those conversations. It seemed like there was accountability and conversations on both sides. And then, like, in the last month, you've seen a lot of guys – uh, jump ships, obviously, with with Dustin being the biggest name uh, to go. So I'm, I'm, and they get up here and they have their interviews and stuff. And I'm sure the money is a big part of it, but I don't know what the other uh, consequences are going to be, the punishments or whatever the fallout is in terms of them leaving the tour. So I'm curious. I don't know enough to to comment on that because I'm just really curious about the whys that they're they're jumping ship. Uh, but it is kind of cool to see certain guys speak out about, you know, the legacy of the tour, the fact that there is room for improvement, but that they're loyal to, you know, the traditions and the history and understand that they still want to chase, you know, trophies and championships that mean something in the history of the of the, of the, the, the game of golf. So I don't think there's anything threatening that, but I was just... I'm very curious as to what live golf and what the whole kind of agreement is that makes these guys want to want to jump ship, you know, especially right now. So Thanks, I'm sure that will continue to show itself. <laughs>